Well, I would invite you to take your Bibles and open them up to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Chapter 5 began, you might remember, with the miraculous healing of the invalid man at the pool of Bethesda. Christ, the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed for his people's sins, he entered Jerusalem that day through the sheep gate, one of ten gates in the wall of Jerusalem. And this was the gate through which the Jews would bring their lambs to the temple to be sacrificed. Jesus entered that gate and then turned immediately to the pool of Bethesda, which means house of grace. And what he saw there was anything but grace. Before him lay a multitude of invalids representing sin and sinners of the whole world, including you and me. And walking directly up to one of the helpless invalids, Jesus showed grace by healing the man. That is a living parable of the gospel. That is the good news that Jesus is willing to heal sinners like you and like me from our worst disease. But you might remember this glorious story ends on an ominous note because John records that the healing took place on the Sabbath. Now that's not a big deal to you and me. It was a huge, deadly deal in Jesus' day for it was on that very issue that the religious leaders determined to murder Jesus. And so I'm using this issue between Jesus and the religious leaders to take a deep dive into the Sabbath, which the Jews had perverted with their man-made rules and regulations. I've titled today's sermon, The History of the Sabbath and of the Day of Resurrection. And I'll just warn you in advance, it will be a bit technical and involved, but I think we will enjoy it because it spotlights that we today live under grace and not under man-made rules and regulations. So let's begin with the first part, and that is the history of the Sabbath. The history of the Sabbath, and I will frame my comments fairly succinctly around three main points. The first is that there was no Sabbath before Moses. There is no record anywhere of any Sabbath observance of anybody in the entire world before the time of Moses. In fact, the first word or the first time that the word Sabbath appears in the Bible is Exodus 16. This is just after Moses led the children of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. And you might remember God miraculously rained down bread from heaven for the Israelites to eat. And then we read this. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. And so that, that's the first record of any Sabbath observance anywhere in the whole history of the world. And that leads to the second point regarding the history of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was for the Jews only. It was for the Jews only. And there are a few key Bible passages that tell us when the Sabbath was instituted and who it was instituted for. The first of these is in the book of Nehemiah. Let me give you a little background on Nehemiah. Nehemiah himself was instrumental in a revival that took place among God's people. So we just read Habakkuk. You might remember towards the end of Habakkuk what happened. Well, his prophecy was fulfilled. God did come against his people, Judah, using the arm of judgment, the Babylonians, the wicked Babylonians. And they took the children of Israel away for 70 years. 70 years later, God had kept them captive. The land just went to waste. And yet God used Nehemiah to lead that, that, that ragtag group of exiles back. And they began to rebuild the walls. But he was instrumental in a revival that took place there as they returned. And this is many, many centuries after Moses. But as part of the revival... God, I mean, Nehemiah rather, encouraged the people to hold a special worship service. And the priest led the people to praise God. And, and here is what they said of God's relationship with Israel. Nehemiah 9.13 You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them, spoke with the Jews from heaven and gave them these things, right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath. And commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. And so what we see here, we see a link right here between the establishment of the Sabbath, because we're looking at the history of the Sabbath, right? When did it happen? Who was it for? So we see a link right here between the establishment of the Sabbath and the giving of the law 
at Mount Sinai. Remember, God led Moses up Mount Sinai, gave him the law. Ten Commandments are part of that. The Sabbath was never known, never observed, never even heard of until that time. And it was for the Jews only. And it began what God gave Moses as the law. That's when it began, when God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. So we're looking at the history of the Sabbath. We're looking at it, it that it's for the Jews only. There's a second passage that helps us out here. This one's from Exodus. It takes us right back to Mount Sinai, that encounter, Exodus 31. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. And so here in this passage from history, the Sabbath is described as a sign between God and who? Israel. It's between God and Israel. The Sabbath never has applied to any other nation other than Israel. Not the United States of America, not Germany, not China, not anybody else, not the ancient Egyptians, not the Babylonians. It is a sign between God and Israel. It was part of the law and it was intended to distinguish Israel from every other nation on the planet. That, that was the whole point of it. The third passage makes the same point. In the book of Ezekiel, God tells us of his special dealings with the Jewish people. Ezekiel 20. God says, I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and made known to them my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And so just yet again here, these verses reiterate that the Sabbath was made known by God at Mount Sinai, and it was exclusively a sign for who? Israel, for the Jews. You know, a final note of interest here before we move on is, is that the Sabbath in ancient Israel wasn't always celebrated on the seventh day of the week, which we just read that it should be, but it wasn't always celebrated on the seventh day of the week. For instance, there were at least... 15 Sabbaths every single year and, and they were on a fixed date in their given month kind of the way we would celebrate Thanksgiving so it's not you know like Christmas is what December 25th so each day shifts it would be like that same thing and so these 15 Sabbaths fell on the particular day of the week regardless I mean the particular date without regard to the day of the week and really just all I'm saying here the Jews did not always observe the Sabbath on Saturday which was the seventh day of the week. Beyond that, there were certain what they called working days in Israel. And these were established in advance. I'll give you an example that we've all heard of. The sacrificial lamb. The Jews had to bring a sacrifice to atone for their sins, right? And, and so here's the way God set that up. If you were a father of a home, you had to go out on the tenth day of the first month and select your sacrificial lamb. And could it just be like some fledgling little thing that was just about to die anyway? No, it had to be the perfect one, right? So you go select the best one. And you do that every single time on the 10th day of the first month. But then you kill it, you roast it with fire, and eat it on the 14th day of the month. Now, there were many, many times when that particular labor and other labors in Israel where they conflicted with the predetermined Sabbath day, which was what? What was the Sabbath, the normal Sabbath day in Israel? Saturday, the seventh day. Now, technically, that was a violation, right, of the Sabbath law, but reality dictated that two different things had to happen on the same day. And here's the thing. God was okay with that. God understood that. God was realistic with that. So let me just summarize really quickly what we've seen so far about the history of the Sabbath. And, and, and we need to lay this groundwork, so stay with me. So we see that the Sabbath was for Israel alone. It was instituted after the Exodus when God gave the law at Mount Sinai. And even in Israel, the Sabbath itself was not always observed on the seventh day of the week. God was never interested in the seventh day as this inflexibly recurring seven, even in Israel. And let me just stop for a moment and just throw out a spiritual lesson for you and for me today. It is useless for you and me to worship God by rules and regulations if our heart is far from him. God is always concerned with your heart. Don't let yourself slip into just following a bunch of rules and regulations to try to get right with God and stay right with God because you will fail miserably. We sinners need a Savior. So there's a third and final point regarding the history of the Sabbath. That's what we're looking at right now, the history of the Sabbath. Here's the third and final point. Jesus Christ coming completely and abruptly 
ended the Sabbath. Ended the Sabbath. Let me remind you, Jesus was born. What was his nationality? If you cut him, what kind of blood flew out of his veins? Jew, the Jew, right? He was born under the law, we read. And so during Jesus' lifetime, he kept the Sabbath, just as any good Jew would. He kept it at least the way God intended it. And yet, at his death on the cross, all of the law that God gave him at Sinai, including the Sabbath obligation, completely and abruptly ended just that quick. Paul declares in one place, Colossians 2.14, Jesus canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. He's talking about just all that law that God would use to judge you and me on judgment day. Jesus canceled that record of debt. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so what he's saying there is that Jesus fulfilled the law with all of its legal demands, so it's no longer necessary. Jesus did it. You and I can't do it. He did it. You know, one way of looking at it is, is Jesus is the substance, not the shadow. So all of the Jews' religious ceremonies and rituals which pointed to Jesus, they were all rendered null and void when he was nailed to the cross. And so the Sabbath, therefore, ended. It ended with Jesus. And let me give you some evidence. We can turn to the book of Acts and see that the Sabbath had totally ended for the early Christian church in the book of Acts. Not one time, if we just had the time to read through Acts, not one time is the Sabbath spoken of as a day that was observed by Christians. Not at all. Nowhere is it even suggested that God's people met on the seventh day, that was Saturday, or there's no evidence that they ever even regarded it as, as having special affection or attention. They just didn't happen. We've got further evidence that the Sabbath ended. We can just look at the rest of the letters in the New Testament, what we call the epistles, and we're told explicitly that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have been freed from all of those kinds of observances. All that law from the Old Testament that was, that was who was it for again? Who was it for? For the Chinese? For the Egyptians? For the, no, it was for the Jews, right? And, and we, we see in the epistles of the New Testament that we're freed from all that. And this is why we find Paul writing, for instance, in Colossians 2, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon. It, that's just all the religious rituals and ceremonies that God's law commanded under the Old Covenant for the Jews. Or, as you can see, or a Sabbath. Don't let anybody judge you for that. And then he says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. True religion is all about whom? Jesus Christ. We worship Christ the King. We worship the substance, not the shadow. Let me give you an illustration. So, I've always been proud of this fact. On the day I was born, the Beatles, who just happened to be my favorite band in history, maybe that was meant to be. So, on the day that I was born, the Beatles performed a live concert at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, California. In fact, I love it. There's an album that has the tickets kind of on the front of the album, and it just shows the day I was born right there, Hollywood Bowl. Well, here, I mean, my goodness. Like, Mom, why didn't you fly me to L.A.? You could have carried me as an infant. You know, I wouldn't have remembered it, but at least you, I could have just bragged I was there, you know. But if I would have been old enough, I would have been there. If you're older than me and you were a Beatles fan and you lived in Los Angeles, California, and you were there that night, you would have moved heaven and earth to be there, right? Well, someone would say, you know, a lot of hassle at those concerts. Sounded very good, you know. Just, it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, in fact, the sound quality of one of their records, you just listen at home. Are you kidding me? I mean, listen to a record in my living room when the band is playing live in my city. You get it? The shadow can never compete with the substance which it casts the shadow. Do you get that? You don't want to listen to a record when you got John, Paul, George, and Ringo playing live. You think Joseph can beat on the drums? Let Ringo get started. That's why we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It's why we don't cling to dead rituals and ceremonies and Sabbaths from back in the Old Covenant, which were for the Jews anyway, and they're now ended. It's significant. That in all of the rest of the New Testament, the only use of the word Sabbath 
is when it is absolutely prohibited. Prohibited for us Christians. Don't do it. Don't do this. That's the, only what, that's the only time you even find the word. It is always portrayed in the New Testament as being in conflict with God's, and here's this beautiful word, with God's grace. It's always in conflict with God's grace. Jesus Christ ended the Sabbath. And so this, this brings us now, at this point this morning, to a radical change of direction. It is a giant turning of a page of history. So we've just closed the chapter on the Sabbath. Sabbath. We've looked at its history, and we are now going to open a new chapter to the history of the day of resurrection. The history of the day of resurrection. There are some church people today who try to make Sunday into something somber. And serious. In fact, the mere fact that I even brought up the Beatles, that could be called into question. What? It needs to be somber and serious, which it was never intended to be. And they try to make it into a duplication of the Jewish Sabbath. And, and they abandoned the celebration of Sunday and instead observe Sunday. Well, this, according to the New Testament, is to fall from grace into the law. God never intended the Sabbath to go on indefinitely. In fact, there is a prophecy about this very thing in the book of Psalm. And this prophecy, we're going to look at it, it tells us that the Sabbath observance would end. It would end. We've already seen it. It ended with Christ. And, and that it would actually give way to an entirely different and brand new Christian celebration. So we read this famous passage in Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now that proverb is quoted with a prophetic cast. It's, it's looking way ahead in time, and it is an image of what, church? That's an image of Jesus Christ's coming death and resurrection. And so Jesus, as you obviously know, he's the stone right there. He's the stone which the religious leaders refused and rejected. And yet, Jesus became the cornerstone of God's righteous dealing with mankind. And the day, the day of the recovery of the stone is what day? The day of the resurrection. And therefore, it is, it is that day, the day of resurrection, that's the new day that the Lord made. That is the day on which everyone who knows him as Savior will be what? According to Psalm 118. Glad. Rejoice. And we know that that is the exact right interpretation of that psalm because that is exactly how the Apostle Peter interpreted that psalm when he spoke before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Here's what Peter said of Jesus. Acts 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so the conclusion from all of this that I've presented to you is that the Christian Sunday, the Lord's Day, has no relationship whatsoever to the Jewish Sabbath. Also, we don't celebrate Sunday because God set aside the seventh day observance for Israel. Why do we celebrate Sunday? We celebrate Sunday because it was on that day that God did a marvelous new thing when he rose, or he raised rather, the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And so with that in mind, very quickly, you might find it interesting that beginning on that day with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is wonderful, Every event recorded in the New Testament from that point forward, every event that has any incredible religious significance, it fell on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Only the Lord could do that. And the first and most important, obviously, of these eight events that I will quickly show you, it occurred on the first day of the week. And it's just this, Christ rose from the dead. Now think about this. When you think about the resurrection, it's... What, of everything in the Bible, of everything in Christianity, what is the one thing that skeptics to Christianity attack the most? Do you know? The resurrection. It is Because if you can just stop that, if you can prove that that's a fake and a fable, well, the Christianity falls apart. But when you consider the resurrection, and then you consider that the earliest Christians worshipped on the first day of the week, rather than observing the Jewish Sabbath, you realize that, really, this is one of the greatest proofs of the evidence 
that the resurrection actually occurred. In other words, it's remarkable that, well, what were the most, the, the earliest believers in Jesus Christ? Were they Chinese? I keep saying Chinese. I don't even know if the Chinese were around back then. But were they Chinese? You know, were they Dutch? Were they Russian? Were they, what were the earliest Christians? In, they lived in Jerusalem, Israel. They were Jews, right? What had they spent their entire life doing when it came to worship? What day did they worship on their entire life up to then? Saturday, the Sabbath, right? And nevertheless, it's up to them. There's no rules yet. There's no church on every corner. There's no sign out front that says we worship at 1045 every Sunday morning. There's nothing. They have a chance to make a choice, and they chose another day for the Christian gathering. That can't come about by chance. That come, can't come about on a whim. You think about it, only the actual historical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ can account for that. And that is one of the great points of evidence for the resurrection. Second, on the first day of the week, the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. He ascended into heaven. And there is great significance, fulfillment of prophecy in that. So way back, we're going to go back to Israel in the wilderness. When they came out of captivity in Egypt, do you remember that big tent that God instructed them to make? What was the name for that? It starts with a T. Yeah, the tabernacle. Remember that one? And it's a big old giant tent. It had that intersection called the most holy place. If you've got a King James Version, it's the holy of holies. And that was veiled off by a thick veil. And inside that inner most holy place, remember it had the Ark of the Covenant. And it was covered with the mercy seat. Those two angels that their arms are outstretched. Just overlaid with pure gold. It's beautiful. And their, their, their wings touching each other. And that's inside that place. And then God, God instituted what was called the Day of Atonement. It's once a year. And there was only one high priest at that point in time. There was not one. There was always one. But the first one was a guy named Aaron. Remember, he's Moses' brother. And so God, God told Aaron to ritualistically purify yourself. So he had to go through all kinds of rituals to, to basically bathe himself, get himself. And he put on like linen undergarments and beautiful things. And he had like a crown and, you know, this ephod on his chest with 12 emeralds and, I mean, all kinds of precious stones. You remember all that stuff? He did all that. And then, and then what did he do? He walked into the tabernacle, kept on going, and with fear and trembling knees, he parted that veil, remember, and he went into that most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was with the, with the mercy seat. That's where God dwelt, and he went in there. And what did he bring with him? He brought with him the blood of a goat, and he took some of that blood, and he actually, actually sprinkled that on the mercy seat, and then he sprinkled some of that blood on the ground before the mercy seat. Now, what was he doing? He... He was making atonement for the sins and transgressions of the people of Israel. And why would he do that? It was so that God in his holy wrath would not come in judgment against them right now. Why wouldn't a holy God come against you, sinner, and me, sinner, right now? He should. He would be just in doing that. What else would we deserve by that? But we are covered by what? By the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so that scene of the high priest entering through the veil into the Holy of Holies, that happened over and over every single year for those many, many centuries of the, of the Jewish people on the Day of Atonement. But everything changed on the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. In fact, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us what happened. Hebrews 9. When Christ came, as high priest of the good things that are now already here. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say it's not a part of this creation. He didn't enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Christ, in other words, is the true high priest. He therefore rendered, as we've seen, all of those sacrifices, all of that stuff on the Day of Atonement, he rendered it null and void. Because, let's face it, can the blood of bulls and goats save anyone? No, it's, it's why we sinners need a sinless sacrifice. It's why we need Jesus. And then, and this brings us back to Jesus' ascension into heaven. He ascended into heaven, right, 40 days after the resurrection. And he, according to Hebrews, entered the most holy place. Now, we're not talking about some little place in a tent anymore. Not even in the temple that came about later. We're talking about he entered right into heaven. And why did he do that? What was, what was he going into heaven to do? He was presenting to God the Father the value of the sacrifice that he had just endured. The author of Hebrews continues, Hebrews 9, 24. 
For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things which are in heaven, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And the Lord Jesus Christ did that momentous thing on our behalf when? On the first day of the week. Third, on the first day of the week, Jesus opened the understanding of his disciples. And we read of this in the magnificent 24th chapter of Luke's gospel. You might remember on the very day that Jesus had been resurrected, two of the disciples, I don't know what they needed to be doing in Emmaus, but they needed to go to Emmaus, and they hadn't yet heard that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so they're walking along, and Jesus catches up to them and declares, here I am. I'm alive. And then Luke writes, Jesus began to, and I quote, open the scriptures to them. And he just started with Genesis and just worked his way all the way through, just saying, that was about me. Oh, look at that one. That's about me. Oh, and this one's about me. He just says, all of it points to me. All of it. And then later that evening, they're in the upper room, and we read this in Luke 24. Then he, that's Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So what are we doing here this morning? We are following Christ's lead. When we pick up our Bible like we did a moment ago and we read it and interpret it every single Sunday. And we can do that. Why? Why can we read God's word and understand it? Because Christ opened our understanding. You know, you could get a Christian and you could get a non-Christian together and you could just open a Bible and hand them that Bible, both of them. And if they can read English, a non-Christian can read it just as easily as a Christian can, right? They can read the same thing. The non-Christian can even tell you a lot about what they just read. But what do we know about them? They're spiritually blind. They're blind to its true spiritual meaning. So they can't interpret it. Whereas we Christians who've had our understanding opened, we can. Let me just give you an example of that. So I could sit down with any of you, and within a few minutes, I could give you the basic rules of phonetics for Greek. So you can just see a Greek sentence right there. And, and we could just read this sentence. So here it is. Hutos gar he mak, or, I'm sorry, he gapesin hote os ton kosmon, hoste ton huion ton monogene edoken. So big deal. <laughs> you, know, you don't really know what I just said to you. Uh, but only those who can read Greek know what that is. Because I just quoted to you something that you, Christian, know very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What a difference when we understand what we're reading, right? And so this opening of our understanding occurred for the first time on the first day of the week. Fourth, on the first day of the week, Jesus commissioned the disciples to the task of world evangelism. He said in John 20, 21, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We are literally here today because of that first commission to go. And, and we today are commissioned as well to go into all of this world with the gospel, even as God the Father commissioned Jesus. And it all began when, church? On the first day of the week. Fifth, on the first day of the week, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven at Pentecost. On that day, the Holy Spirit began his ministry and it has continued every single day of the entire age of the Christian age, of the Christian church, right up to right now. He is active right now doing his ministry. Right now, we look to the Holy Spirit to give us spiritual gifts, to give us spiritual skills. We look right now for the Holy Spirit to work among us, to correct us, to convict us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to send us, to forgive all these things, all through the preaching and teaching of the Bible. Sixth, on the first day of the week, the Holy Spirit directed Paul to gather the believers together and to preach to them. That story is told in Acts 20. Paul was doing missionary work in a city called Troas. And we know from Acts that he spent seven days in that city. That is, he was there for each of the seven days of the week. That includes a seventh day and the first day. And that's Saturday and Sunday. That's how long he was there. So Paul obviously had an opportunity right then. He could choose between either one of those two days. First time there's ever been a church in that city. It never heard the name of Jesus Christ. He shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. God saved people. He gathered them together for the first time. He can pick any day he wants. He's there, right? Which one's he going to do? We're told this. Acts 27. And upon the first 
day of the week. When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Just yet another indication of the normal pattern of the early Christian observance. Christians began meeting together to worship the risen Lord when church on the first day of the week. Seventh, Paul established the first day of the week for offerings to be taken and dedicated to the Lord's work. We read of this in 1 Corinthians 16 when Paul said, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. On the first day of the week. Finally, on the first day of the week, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to the apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. It was on that day that Jesus gave John the great revelation of himself. That, what is Jesus Christ doing right now? Where is he right now? He is in the throne room of heaven and we learn everything about his present heavenly glory right now. It is in that revelation that Christ gave to John where Jesus outlined the rest of his plans. His plans for the future, his plans for the church, his plans for everything that's going to happen after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have this revelation recorded for us in which book of the Bible, church? The book of Revelation, right? Which John received from Jesus on which day of the week? On the first day of the week. And so really what we have here with these eight events is the present pattern for celebratory worship. That's what we have. These eight events, all of which occurred on the Lord's Day rather than on the Jewish Sabbath, they show us the importance of the day of res resurrection for the church. They give us our pattern. In fact, everything we do in church today is based on those eight things, by the way, and some more, but basically that. In fact, they are this. The gathering of ourselves together, the reading and interpreting of the scriptures. We did that from Habakkuk earlier. The preaching and teaching of the word of God. Well, we're doing that right now. The collection of offerings. Oh, wow, we did that. These boxes contain those right now. The observance of communion. We haven't done that this morning, but we're going to do it soon. And above all, the remembrance and worship of the one who died for us and rose again. That's who, that's who we're worshiping right now. And it's a joyful thing. We are to be glad in that. It is a wonderful celebration. And we don't do these things by accident. This is God's pattern. And we follow it out of just thanksgiving for what God has done for us because of Christ. And we, we observe the Lord's Day every single week. And I want to close with this. We do it as a weekly reminder that we don't live under the law like the Jews did. God did never intend for that to happen indefinitely. Even for them, there's only one plan of salvation, and that's Jesus Christ, right? There's only one cornerstone, that's Jesus Christ. This is a weekly reminder that you don't have to do anything to get right with God. You don't have to keep doing anything to stay right with God. You can't. You'll fail miserably. Try as hard as you can. Pick any religion you want. I don't care if it's Judaism, if it's Islam, even if it's Christianity. So long as you are trying to work your way up to God to get right and stay right with Him, you will fail miserably. So this is a weekly reminder that you are not under law. You are under grace. We are under grace. We can live under the sunshine of God's grace. That is our right as members of God's new creation. We have been called by grace. We've been redeemed by grace. We've been justified by grace. We are sanctified by grace. God operates constantly under grace. He is our gracious God. That's a wonderful thing. Would you please stand to your feet, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we admittedly, God, just kind of got nerdy. At least I did roll my sleeves up and just dived head deep into the Old Testament. You want us to do those things. You want us to see how you operated with the Jews, how you took this little fledgling group of people and, and separated them entirely from the world so that through them you could send the Messiah of the world, the Savior of all mankind. That's Jesus Christ. And we just thank you, God, that we live now in this era of your grace, that we can know you, be, be known by you. In fact, you tell us that you adopt us as your own children, sons and daughters. So you're not just like angry at us half the time, forgiving us because of Jesus. No, your, your heart is full of love for us, God. And we just want to thank you for that. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.